Henrik is coming from Oslo. He's um, at the Oslo University and at KPMG. He just uh, published a great book, AI for Sustainability Goals, yeah. um, which I want to read. <laughs> and um, also we're working together on uh, hopefully a book chapter soon. Yes, yeah. indeed. Is that official actually? No, can I say that? Yes, it is now. Oh, okay. We got the contracts. <laughs> I was like, okay, maybe yeah. I shouldn't say anything. No, 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 we got the contracts, so this is good. <laughs> okay, good, okay. Let's see if I get it up here. Okay, you need help? I think it's good. Yeah, okay. Let me see. Yes, perfect. Let's see. Yes. So, my name is Henrik. I'm a political theorist of all things, but I'm working mainly on uh, technology now. Psychology, technology, and issues of how technology influences individuals, groups, and society. So that's kind of my approach to this topic. Uh, the topic is social robots. So what distinguishes social robots from other areas in which overtrust might be relevant? For example, weather prediction systems and AI systems, for example. We can trust and overtrust those, but it's a bit different when it comes to social robots with eyes and mouths. They interact with us in a totally different way, and this creates other issues that might be useful for kind of understanding how we relate to social robots. But these issues of how social robots create trust and gender trust might also be useful as we might use it for other sorts of systems in which uh, we haven't traditionally been using social features because social features are integral to building and kind of um, breaking down trust, which is also beneficial at times if we have overtrust. So, what is our trust? Uh, this has been partially covered, uh, covered already, so I'll be quick here. Uh, deceive to cause and mitigate over trust. Can we manipulate and deceive in order to create or break down over trust? I, I say yes, and I think this is a crucial feature for how we can kind of deal with over trust through manipulation and deception. And this ties into uh, Dagmar's uh, keynote on AI ethics, right? Because this involves highly ethical issues, these issues of over trust. And or can we mitigate through knowledge? Can we give people more knowledge? Literacy is another keynote later on, which is also highly relevant. Can this be used to mitigate over trust? So trust is talked about everywhere pretty much. As digital technology becomes uh, an ever more central part of every aspect of people's lives, people should be able to trust it. Trustworthiness is also a prerequisite for its uptake, right? But trust in technology, as a social scientist, I was struck immediately by how can we trust a machine, right? But that goes to who, who, who is the one being trusted here, really? Is it the companies, is it the developers, or is it actual trust in the machine? Because that kind of, I struggle a bit to make that make sense. So this is an interesting approach. And there is a lot of talk about trust, so over trust is definitely important. But what is it? We've already seen some already, right? The attitude that an agent will help achieve an individual's goals in a situation characterized by uncertainty and invulnerability. Un That's been covered. The reliance by an agent that actions prejudicial to their well-being will not be undertaken by influential others. Different types of trust. And this is kind of the general literature on trust. Because if we want to talk about trust without saying what sort of trust are we talking about, we have to realize that other people put kind of diff uh, use a different concept of trust than technologists use. When we talk about benevolence-based trust, for example, integrity-based trust, we tr I trust your integrity, so I take your word for it. I don't have any guarantees, I can't coerce you, I don't have any contracts, but I trust you, I know you to be kind of a person of integrity. Uh, I know you to be a benevolent person, I trust you to be a benevolent person, right? But does this sort of trust make sense with a social robot, for example? Is it meaningful to talk about the benevolence of a robot, the integrity of a robot, the virtue of a robot? I'd say no. I'd say this goes to, if you use this sort of trust, we have to talk about developers and human beings, right? Because machines don't really have benevolence or integrity in that sense. So that brings us to another point later on, where I think the difference between trust and reliability is important and something we have to deal with. The classical example is from Robinette, right? What should we do now? Uh, a fire breaks out and you have an evac evacuation robot. Um, what should we do? In this experiment, they introduced uh, the participants to a demonstration of an evacuation robot that was supposed to guide people to safety in case of an emergency. And this was presented as kind of a, a hypothetical, a fictional um, example. And the robot malfunctioned in this demonstration. 
It, it's obviously malfun malfunction. It gave them the wrong advice in the demonstration. So they knew that the robot was not perfect. They knew that the robot could not really be trusted. But what they did afterwards, which is what was fun, is that they, they enacted an actual emergency just after this faulty presentation, where they had smoke alarms go off and they had smoke in the room and they pretended that this was a real emergency. And then the robot started showing the way, right? And then the robot once again started to guide these people to safety. But it once again went into a completely, obviously nonsensical way. They led people into a room with no exits but people still followed it, right? So people still followed this robot even if they knew from demonstration right before that it was faulty. So that's kind of one of the examples. That's kind of the classical example in the robots and overtrust literature. So how can we avoid that, right? How can we avoid people just shutting off their rational faculties and critical sense and just following a robot? How can we make sure they don't do this? That's the key point, I think. So overtrust defined in this literature an insufficient calibration, that's already been discussed. A situation in which a person misunderstands the risk associated with an action because the person either underestimates the loss associated or the chance that a robot will make such a mistake, or both. Or a situation where a robot or an automated system's expected performance exceeds its actual constraints. So these are some of the definitions that's used on overtrust. This is the reason why I'm here, I think, because we wrote this article, Overtrusting Robots, setting a research agenda uh, to mitigate overtrust in automation, where we talk about uh, deception and anthropomorphism, we talk about education, and we talk about regulation and these kinds of aspects related to overtrust. And this is an emerging field. It's not that much literature on it yet, and the definitions are still being made. So I think this is a, an area where it makes sense to say that we can shape this. These are two different from Booth uh, and et al. Overtrust is the unfounded belief that the robot does not intend to deceive or carry risk. A belief held by the truster that the trustee will not act with deception and that the trustee will not put the truster at risk. If you look at the first definition here, it says that the robot does not intend to deceive. Right? So th this already is anthropomorphizing the robot, right? We say that the robot has the capacity to intend anything at all. But we can question whether it does, right? We can say that, but a robot can't intend this. So this really goes to something else. But even in the literature, people are discussing robots and machines as something that can actually intend to do something. And that is a problem in itself, I think. But this goes to kind of the deception and risk, kind of the intentions and the risk. But this goes to trust, what we believe, what are subjective perceptions of what the robot intends to do or will do or will not do. But the different, uh, the related component here that we could also discuss and that I think is useful to distinguish is trust and reliance. Because reliance is something a bit different than trust. When I trust something, that entails something a bit more than when I rely on something. I can rely on my car not breaking down, for example. I can rely on my coffee machine. But I don't trust my coffee machine. I don't trust my car, perhaps. But this is where they distinguish between trust and reliance as a user's behavior that follows from the advice of the system, where you get it, the advice from an automated system and you follow it. You might not trust it, you might not think it's benevolent, or you might not question it, its intentions, but you follow its advice because you believe in it, you rely on it. And this is a recent, a recent paper where they discussed this kind of need, and I know you, sh you shared it as well, this kind of, sh the, this, the need to distinguish between trust and reliance. And this is an example from another relatively recent article that kind of highlights this. Because if, this is from a study in 2021 where they introduced children to social robots. And the child said, the child indicated that it did not trust the robot, but still said, if the robot says so, it must be true. So they followed the robot's advice, but they clearly stated that they did not trust the robot, right? So individuals are using this concept differently, and we could too, I guess. This is uh, one way that we might pursue to mitigate or reduce overtrust, I say. To use deception to figure out how anthropomorphism influences trust and see whether we can reduce or create uh, a beneficial level of trust based on these mechanisms. 
Uh, hypothesis zero, you, know, you, you avoid, avoid anthropomorphizing features in order to mitigate overtrust. That's one commonly heard feature in the literature on robots. But a different one as well that says we should provide robots with cues of human insecurity and sociability in order to reduce overtrust. And you saw it in the cars with this little figure, right? It says, oh, oh I'm not sure. With your, this might kind of answer your question, but I'm not sure, right? So this kind of fakery, if you want to, right? To create this kind of human sense of being insecure in order to kind of reduce people's reliance on a system. <laughs> A recommendation, uh, Wagner, Bornstein, Howard, from an influential paper here, they said that a recommendation to consider, at least in some cases, is to avoid features that my, may nudge users toward anthropomorphizing robots. Because this can induce a false sense of familiarity in users, resulting in the expectation of human-like responses, when in fact the associated risk much, may be much higher. Still, we see that when we anthropomorphize technology, we might rely on it a bit less because we know humans to be faulty. We know humans to be not 100% sure of everything we do. So if you have automation bias, the thing that says a kind of a, a, a machine might be perfect at per you doing something. If we introduce human features, we might actually reduce trust in that system because that system is no longer perceived as kind of a mere, a mere machine, a perfect machine. So we can use it in that sense as well, is what I'll argue now. But it goes both ways. So it's, it's about that kind of finding the trust calibration and using this in a beneficial way. And this is a dilemma. Because effective human-robot interaction requires deception. That's my statement, but it's also a fairly mainstream statement, I think, that we need to have a certain level of deception in order to create effective HRI. To get people to accept medical treatment, for example, uh, increased cooperation in games, in various situations. We need to fake a bit of the social interactions, the social capabilities, the small talk, the small cues, hints. All those things facilitate, facilitate effective HRI. Increased social engagement by cheating in a game, for example. They saw that if they made the robot cheat a little bit in a, in a game, it was perceived as human, as a social companion, and it created a better social functioning, social engagement. Builds human-machine trust, if we deceive. But deception and manipulation is often proposed as a key to mitigate overtrust, as we saw. To communicate uncertainty and to activate the user's critical faculties. So the evacuation robot, for example, instead of just saying, okay, I'll lead to safety, it might uh, use several features um, to fake um, uncertainty in order to make the person that's following the robot actually think through, should I trust the robot or should I myself consider what the best way I am out may be and be critical to the robot's advice. It might use, use cues, for example, facial expressions or words to say that I'm not really sure what do you think, for example, to activate that kind of partnership, to activate that kind of human critical uh, faculties. But more radical is kind of the programming of occasional errors, because people talk about this and they say that we can actually program our machines to malfunction intentionally. But they say this is a problem, kind of a reputational problem, for example, if I make machines that kind of fail, but it might also make people not rely on them. And in one experiment, they talk about, they use this pet feeding robot, where they, they have people in this experiment where they are asked whether or not they trust a pet to feed their cat. The, the, the cat will survive three days without food, and they, can, they have this kind of experiment where they let people choose whether or not they call in and check on how the, the pet feeding robot is doing. And in this experiment, they check uh, how, um, and the reputation of the robot, how a demonstration of the robot, and how their experience with the robot actually influences the level of trust. And of course, in this experiment, it functions very well for quite a long time, and then it actually fails and kills the cat if people rely too much on it. So they kind of measured this through a 30-day period, which is quite interesting. And they say, and they introduced this notion that we should make it fail at certain times in order to create that kind of fundamental uncertainty about what the machine can do. So the trade-off is in terms of if we think that deception is wrong, if we think that manipulation is wrong, we have a trade-off, right? Because we have the ethical issues involved in actively manipulating people. 
But we also have the trade-offs related to overtrust creating problems as well, because overtrust or, an or undertrust might lead to inefficient outcomes. So we have to weigh these harms in a certain sense. So some here point to consequentialism and John Stuart Mill and say that if the, if the consequences of deception are better than not deceiving, then we should do it. But others have different views, right? But less human is more overtrust or more human is more deceptive. I'm not quite sure. But overtrust creates dangerous situations. And deception is ethically problematic. But what about pro-social deception, for example? Humans deceive all the time. I deceive all the time, I fake all the time, I pretend to be interested in things all the time, I pretend and play games all the time, right? So we do it all the time. So if robots, social robots, are to be introduced in social settings, we might not be able to say that they can never fake anything or that they might never be deceptive. But this could also erode trust beyond each instance of deception, for example. So if we deceive, if we use deception and manipulation actively, we might actually influence people's ability or tendency to trust in general. So I'll go quickly to the other one here, because I think deception plays a key role in both creating overtrust and mitigating overtrust. And that's something we could discuss in this kind of workshop part if we're doing it. In terms of education and machine literacy, we'll see more soon. So some people propose, for example, should passengers of autonomous vehicles undergo dedicated safety training in the sense of a license and tests tailored to inform them about the capacities of the system at hand? For example, if you buy a Tesla, you have to read the manual and you read that the car is prone to malfunction at certain times. But we know that people don't respond that well to those kinds of kind of rational information at times. So I think this is not at least the whole solution. So what we propose in that paper I talked about is that the education is crucial both for the designers and developers, for regulators, and for the users. But in terms of users, there is a long way to go if we are to think that we can educate people to a sufficient degree to avoid overtrust. I think we can't. Because which user are we talking about? If we're talking about us, yes, we might be able to comprehend the true nature of a social robot. We might be able to comprehend how a machine works, what it can and what it cannot do, and thus act relatively kind of in accordance with the true cap the capabilities. The children, for example, are demonstrated to be prone to overtrusting robots. And we can't really assume that they will read a manual and kind of get an explanation of the true features and then they will act accordingly, no. So I think education in this sense is not sufficient. It might be important, but not sufficient. Same with uh, the people with dementia, for example, they get paro, the seal, a social robot, these kinds of things. We know that they also are prone to misunderstand or misapprehend, misperceive the true nature of the robots. So I think it's really crucial that we know that an increasingly diverse and naive population are going to encounter social robots and machines. So I think we have to figure out how to deal with this without thinking that we can fully educate everyone. And what about those without the rational faculties or cognitive capabilities required to kind of rational, rationally perceive overtrust? I have, think we have to deal with this in a different way as well. So what about explainability though? That was another thing you mentioned, right? The creation of an explainable robot will not result in better trust calibration or will do so only over a narrowly tailored subset of users or applications, is what Wagner and Robinette says in 2021. Because they have found that all research shows that whenever you give an explanation, even a nonsensical explanation, this has a huge effect on whether or not people believe you or act according to your advice, for example. So when people are just wanting to use a copier before someone else, if they just said, I want to copy, they might not be able to. If they say, I want, I want to make a copy because I am, I'm in a hurry or because I need to make a copy or just make any kind of nonsensical explanation, that radically changes behavior. Because that uh, increases our perception of the, per of the machine's capabilities and also their um, the likelihood that they will malfunction, they say. So explanation is not the key either, perhaps, but it might be interesting. And they said we might use it, for example, in certain senses. If the robot makes an error, immediately explain why the error was made, for example, these kinds of things. So it's crucial that we don't think that just education and just explainability is enough. But we'll see whether or not data literacy is something better. I've used my time 
a bit more. Uh, what Balin says is that we need machines that monitor and that measure, monitor and adapt in order to kind of facilitate the trust calibration that we're talking about. How do we measure it? That's uh, difficult, but the social robots have this perceptive sensors that can read expressions, for example. We can, uh, to a certain degree, measure trust in that sense, but they also said we need to play trust games. We need to do sort of certain experiments. We need to interact in order to go out and engage trust in order to then monitor it and see whether it's at the appropriate level, and then we adapt. But how do we adapt? And that's what we're kind of trying to figure out today. Is how do we mitigate? And I say deception is uh, part of it. Education might be part of it as well, but not a full picture. So that's where I think we'll be going into different things later on. So this is a little bit about social robots and over trust. So I look forward to discussing it later on. So I think we might just have one or two questions. Go ahead. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, I was thinking, yeah, as you mentioned uh, in one of the last slides, uh, uh, how education will be part of that. At, uh, we started to see more technolo technological tools also in the schools, uh, in education, so, um, and also the behavior that kids has on the internet, so trusting in general with technology. Uh, do you think, in general, all of you, if uh, education uh, will be the huge part of the solution. Um, I wasn't aware of this approach of uh, make the, the robots a little bit malfunctioning. It's, it's a little bit scary <laughs> to a technology perspective, also to know what are the limits of this malfunction. It has to be really tested uh, each step of the way. And um, yeah, so both uh, um, actually, <laughs> yeah, it's the question for uh, the technological approach yeah. on how to find the limits and uh, how education will play a role of that. Yeah, I can start with the first, at least because data, uh, data literacy, machine literacy is uh, crucial, I think. And in terms of regular machines, and for example, AI uh, weather prediction systems, I think education will go a long way if kids and everyone growing up gets this kind of basic competency about what these systems can and cannot do. I think that will be kind of good for those kinds of systems. But when it comes to social robots, we have this kind of, I distinguish between what I call partial deception and full deception at times, because full deception means that a social robot makes you believe that it's not a robot. That you kind of, you believe it's something it's not, right? You fully, you rationally think it's something it's not. But even what I call partial deception, that means that I know that a social robot is a robot. I know that a social robot is not a human, that it doesn't have intentions, that it doesn't, th that, uh, that it's not human. But even despite this, I react to it as if it does. Despite my rational kind of uh, comprehension of what it is, I respond to it due to it activating this kind of social mechanisms that are deeply ingrained in humans. So whenever you have this deeply or it's highly anthropomorphized technologies, I think it, do, it will not suffice to educate people because we respond intuitively to eye expressions, to this eye gaze behavior, all these sorts of things, triggers behavior that's not rational. So I think that's why I think when it comes to robots, I think education is not enough, but it might be very important, but not enough. <laughs> do you want to add something? Yeah. Uh, I have a com comment to make, right? Yes. Um, what was fascinating for me is that most of the things that you said here actually also apply for not just robots, but for machine learning as a technology in general, yeah. right? And when we keep talking about educating users, um, somehow in, 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 in our space, we always think about users as some, someone external to ourselves, as someone out there. But the reality is we're all users of machine learning, right? And I'm not talking specifically about robots now, but I'm talking about trust in, in, in machine learning and AI in general. Um, and there are several layers of abstraction between a machine learning principle and a machine learning model and its decision, final decision that it assists in a user, user making. And these layers of abstraction always need to be teased out, I have the feeling, and we as researchers especially, and appliers of this particular um, technology 
need to be more responsible in doing that. And for that, I found this talk um, as, as, as a metaphor be really useful. So thank you. Ah, thank you very much. And I agree. And in some of my articles, I talk about social AI rather than social robots, and many of the same issues apply. Of course, you get an additional layer, an additional tendency to anthropomorphize physical robots, but it's very much the same. And people attribute human features to anything, even their lawnmowers and everything, right? So, so it's, not, uh, it's not a kind of clear distinction here. It's just even, it's more prevalent in social robots. But I also think that we can actively use these anthropomorphizing features on uh, regular AI and machine learning techniques in order to kind of facilitate, as we saw in the car, for example, right? As we saw in these different kind of uh, things, we can use these techniques to make, yeah, make people question and be critical to other sorts of technologies as well. But I agree, there's, uh, it's very much important for non-robots as well. trust, let's say, things that we believe are kind of agents. Mm -hmm. And does the, the fact that uh, such systems have, are very versatile, have a lot of capacity, make that we project kind of, uh, of agency into them, whether if we have to do with uh, thousands of uh, small items that would do one thing, mm -hmm. we would have less that uh, Yes. That feeling. Yeah, yeah, I definitely uh, think so. I think that a thermostat, for example, or these kind of simple things that m might be kind of characterized as some form of AI, right? Yeah. I, I don't think yeah. people uh, project intentions or project yeah. kind of emotions or these sort of things to them. But the more human-like they become, the more complex they become, the more similar to us in behavior and capacities they become, the more likely we are to attribute things to them that they don't have. So I agree. I think that it's more prevalent the more complex and capable assistance. So the strategy could be that when we do it, we try to disaggregate, let's say, those uh, Definitely. capacities. Yeah, so that would be the anti-anthropomorphizing feature, yeah. right? Instead of trying to gather this into a virtual assistant, for example, yeah. we could just make it a dashboard that's clearly technical and kind of distinguished pieces. For example, that's a good point. Uh, thanks for the interesting talk. So I was wondering if there, I don't know if the definition of overtrust also applies to people, to humans, but I was wondering because uh, sometimes we also trust in roles like doctors, right? Uh, we, we in, in, a, in a situation where we have asymmetric information, we trust these people, although maybe we shouldn't. Mm. Do you see an, an analogy uh, in, or like a comparison between these situations also? Yes, I think that that's kind of the um, epistemic power, people call it the power of authority, for example, that you have in a doctor. But that's, uh, so most people would say that kind of, uh, often that's calibrated trust. If you trust a doctor, even if you don't know, right, you, you believe he knows more than you, so you trust this applies. But you might, of course, overtrust someone, and a human as well. And I think from 2000, early 2000s, people have been using overtrust in a business sense as well where you trust contracts, you trust companies. So that's, there is a long lineage here, and people usually talk about overtrust also as something that's applicable to, to human beings. So we can overtrust someone. If I believe your intentions are good, I believe, believe you're benevolent and have, have integrity, right? Mm -hmm. So I trust you, and that creates risk on my end. I take um, more risk than I should when I interact with you. So that would be a case of uh, overtrust as well. So unless we say that trust in automation or trust in machines is something different than trust, period, I think, yes, and I, I, I would be a proponent of saying that trust is trust, and that we have to use the same concept of trust when it comes to machines, companies, and people. So that, that would be my perspective, but some are using the concept of trust in a different way with machines. Mm -hmm. So I think, yes, both. I think people use it in both ways, but I think we should use trust as what we talk about, which we have trust in institutions, trust in people, trust in machines. 
in order to avoid confusion. But that's, that's a point that hasn't really been settled yet in the literature as I see it. Hmm. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We will have the chance to discuss later on more, so I think we should